Uh, I will soon start about Auslander rate and theory. I just want to, to finish what, I mean, the, this thing I spoke to you about. So I copied my last blackboard, except that I added one to simplify the reasoning. Uh, so two and three are one and two of yesterday. Okay, so I will give you the argument of the proofs. Uh, I, it's not complicated, but uh, it's maybe interesting to see that one. Uh, so, one. And also it will permit me to emphasize in which context it's actually true. It's true in much big, wider context than what I'm saying here. So, for this, what I will say is the following thing. If you have an endomorphism of X and you consider uh, the image of the power of x, now I'm speaking about the set image, so the domain of the image included. You have the following uh, included in the domain, um, in the codomain, sorry. Uh, you, you can do the following thing, which is obvious. The image of f contains the image of f squared, and so on. Okay, But the point is that at some point it will stabilize. And this is the important thing that you are using. This is the only property you are really using. You are using the fact that things are finite dimensional. Or you could use the fact that they are finite lengths if you want to generalize a bit. But essentially what you want to use is that they are uh, finite dimensional. So at some point you will have that. Okay? And in the same way for the kernel. So the kernel of f is in general smaller than the kernel of f square. And at some point it stabilized. And as I'm lazy, I will put the same n, of course. Yeah, okay, you, you could prove. I mean, it's not difficult to prove that this is actually the same n. This is uh, uh, the so called uh, rank nullity theorem. Uh, which tell you that it's the same n. Uh, so, yeah, n now I'm using basic linear algebra because, of course, you can, I mean, everything you do, you can think of it as a composition of linear map as well. Uh, so, at some point, you get that, and then it implies that. Uh, it implies that uh, for some obvious reason. Or obvious. Maybe, maybe I can say slightly more. Uh, you know by dimension argument that the sum of dimension is okay, right? So you just need to prove that they don't intersect or they intersect at zero to prove that they are indirect sum. But if ever there is an intersection between the image of Fn and the kernel of Fn, uh, then if you apply Fn once again, so you go to F2n, the dimension of the image will decrease because there is some, somebody that you have in the image of Fn that you will map to zero by applying Fn. So necessarily, the intersection is zero. I mean, otherwise it, it would not stabilize. Of course, I didn't say, but once you are here, it will stabilize forever. So you have that. And then two and three are under the condition that x is indecomposable. Or I suppose that x is indecomposable, but then they become Easy. I will almost let it as an exercise. I will do it uh, uh, orally. Oh no, no, three is not so easy. Two is easy. From one, indeed, if x is indecomposable, it means that one of them is x, right? One of them is zero. One of them is x. Direct sum. Uh, I mean, an indecomposable is not cannot be written non-trivially as a direct sum. So there are two possibilities: either the kernel of f n is x, it means that fn equals zero. Either the image of fn is x, it means that f to the n is subjective, therefore f is subjective, and by usual dimension argument, f is invertible. Uh, okay? So two is easy under one. And then there is three. Uh, so what do I do in three? Now that I know that there is this dichotomy, I want to study the nilpotent element 
of uh, this uh, endomorphism ring, this is a ring, and I'm telling you that it's a maximal ideal. So when I say ideal, I often, I usually think to two-sided ideal. So it's a maximal ideal of the endomorphism ring. And how to prove that? Well, there are several things. Yeah? Yeah, because you know by dimension argument that the sum of the dimension is the dimension of x, right? So, yeah, if you know that the intersection is zero, then they are in direct sum. Okay? So, uh, yeah, and, uh, and yeah, for, for, for two is a Nivy consequent. And what about three? Uh, three, so you need to prove, first of all, that it's an ideal. It's actually the most difficult part, but it's not so difficult. So, first thing, uh, so you need to prove that it's stable by, by composing with another morphism. It's what, what means to be an ideal. I mean, it's a part of what is an ideal. So if I take uh, G in uh, and X and F nilpotent, okay, uh, I don't write everything, but F is nilpotent, G not necessarily. It means especially that uh, uh, F is not injective. So GF either. So if it's not injective, it's not invertible, then by two it is nilpotent. By two GF is nilpotent. Right? Okay, the same for yeah, okay. Uh, so same for F G is the same, I mean please do it. <laughs> Um, so now we know that it's stable by multiplication by endomorphism, by composition, because it's my multiplication in and x. And then now, it's a slightly more tricky part, but not that tricky. I want to prove that it's stable by summing two elements. So how do I do that? First of all, I claim the following thing. If f is nilpotent, uh, when I write nil, it means nilpotent, then the identity of x minus f is invertible. And this, you, do, you did it all at school at some point, because actually, identity of x, I will write it like that, minus f to the minus 1 is just f to the 0 plus f to the 1 plus, plus whatever. So I wrote a series, but as f is nilpotent, it stopped at some point, and yeah, plus uh, f to the n. Well, yeah, plus f to the n plus 1, but this is already 0, so yeah, you can stop. And yeah, this is just uh, algebraic computation that you all know how to do to prove that these are inverse of each other. So you have that. But now, next step, if g is invertible, and f nilpotent, then g minus f is invertible. Yeah, it's, it's easy because g minus f is equal to g times the identity minus f, uh, g minus 1 f. But according to what we already saw, this is nilpotent. So this is because and you multiply nilpotent by somebody is still nilpotent, so this is nilpotent. Therefore, this thing is invertible, that thing as well, so this is invertible. Okay? Uh, G and both vectors are invertible, so you can invert. Okay. I, I just write it like that. It's, it's the reason for that. So you know that. But then, uh, by a bit of contraposition, uh, yeah, it concludes. Therefore, uh, if f1, f2 are nilpotent, then f1 plus f2 is also. Indeed, if it was not nilpotent, it would be invertible, and then you apply the previous one by putting g equal f1 plus f2, and you take f1, and yeah, okay, you, you all see what I mean. Okay, so uh, it's an ideal. 
okay, but the, uh, so, so you are almost done because now you know that it's an ideal and you want to prove that it's a maximal ideal. Actually, I will correct even slightly. It is a unique maximal ideal. And the reason is very simple. Because now, if you take this thing and you add anybody else, anybody else is invertible, and an invertible element in a ring generates all the ring as an ideal. So of course, you cannot add anybody else. So, yeah, it finished the proof. It's a unique maximal ideal. It's an important property of indecomposable, uh, of indecomposable uh, object or, mod or representation. Uh, that uh, the endomorphism ring is somehow local. I say somehow because it's a non-commutative version of local. Okay? Um, then I will prove the corollary very fast. So, proof of the corollary. So, now that you have that, it's reasonably easy. Uh, it's essentially basic linear algebra. I take my two isom converse isomorphism so i have isomorphism and i will write as mat them as matrix so i will write this probably it's uh, psi ij for uh, so i should be equal to uh, 1 to m, I write it in the usual way we compose uh, matrices. So as I told you yesterday, once you have decomposed an object, you can write any morphism from two objects in a matrix form. That means that psi, psi ij is going from xj to yi. Okay, and then it works. Yeah. And then, of course, you can, in this direction, take some phi uh, j i, say, where with the same indices. Uh, so you have two isomorphisms. The point is that they are converse isomorphisms. So you have psi i j composed with phi j i equal, uh, no, no, I should not write like that. You have psi composed with phi equal the identity of x. x, for shortcut, is the direct sum of that. Uh, do I do in the good direction? No, it's the identity of y, sorry. <laughs> okay, so it's the identity of y. But then, if it is the identity on y, in particular, you can write the following identity. The identity of y1, you all know how to multiply matrix, is the sum for k equal 1 to n of, so let me see, uh, I'm composing in this direction, so psi 1k composed with 5k1. Okay? This thing is invertible. It implies by the previous proposition that there exists k such that psi 1k composed with uh, phi k1 is invertible. Okay? So you have that. Right. Now, what you can do is the following thing. Uh, I write phi, I, I finish the proof, it's very fast now. I write phi k1 tilde uh, equal phi k1 composed with uh, the inverse of this thing. Phi 1k composed with phi k1 inverse in such a way that now actually psi 1k composed with phi k1 is equal uh, tilde is equal actually, sorry, I'm starting to write very badly my Greek letters. Uh, this is a phi, this is a psi, sorry is equal to the identity of uh, y1, okay? I'm just, yeah, so you have that. But now, what can you deduce from that? You can deduce, and this is it, so I let you uh, work with it, that 
this composition is an idempotent, uh, please check, of uh, xk. Just because if you square it, you will have the identity which appears at the middle and you can remove it. So it's an idempotent of xk, but xk is indecomposable, so by proposition again, it's also invertible of, or nilpotent, but an idempotent, idempotent it means that you square you get itself. An idempotent which is nilpotent, it's zero, but it cannot be zero, because otherwise the other composition would not be identity. So it's also not equal to zero and idempotent by proposition. Therefore, this thing is invertible, it's uh, identity. Identity. Okay. What you proved is that y1 is actually isomorphic to xk. Finish your proof. It does not finish your proof, but you are all able to do an induction, so I let you do an induction by yourself. Okay? Uh, so you, once you have that, you can remove them from the direct sum and do an induction. Okay. So, I basically finished what I wanted to say in last previous <laughs> lecture, and now I will try to start about AR theory. So, so I will speak about Auslander Rayton theory. So, in a sense, Auslander Rayton theory is a way to study extension. It's kind of a very convenient way when it applies to study, uh, I would say, first extension, but even more. And in case of quiver, it applies. So we can do that. So I will call that two. Auslander written theory. And uh, yeah, very often, we say AR, so each time you see AR, it means Auslander written, yeah? Yeah, it's idempotent. Okay, sorry. It's idempotent because you can comp uh, Yeah, why I say that? Uh, Non-zero non and I don't want to say idempotent. Okay, I don't know. Uh, I should say so invertible. I, uh, sorry, I, I don't know. It's, uh, I, was, I went too fast. Uh, so it's non-zero. Uh, yeah, okay, I don't know why I wrote. Uh, it's either invertible, either nilpotent. Okay, I, I don't know if... Okay, sorry, uh, please uh, complete the argument. I didn't write it correctly. Uh, the point is that it is an idempotent, which is either nilpotent, either invertible, therefore it's uh, either zero or the identity, and it cannot be zero, so it's the identity. Okay, that's what's the point. Okay, let's start about auslander rayton theory. auslander rayton theory essentially tells you the following thing. I will do it in a very uh, kind of simplified word, or probably you will not all understand, but it tells you that the extension functor have a one-dimensional circle. Okay, maybe you don't understand what it means, but it means that um, each time you have a given extension, which is non-zero, you can, up to multiplying on the left or the right by some morphism, reach one canonical one, or almost canonical one, in a natural way. So I will give a clear uh, statement for this proposition. So proposition, so this is a proposition, I don't know, one, one, or whatever, it's not very important. I take psi. So it's an extension from V to Y. So I consider it really in the, in the X group. Oh yeah, by, by the way, we often say X group, even if it's a vector space, which is particularly a, a group for the addition. So yeah, perfect, like that. So I take it as an element of the X group. And the following are equivalent. So I will write in two different ways each of my following. 
So maybe I will say one. So what is one? For all z prime, for all morphism of the form z prime to z, then which is not a split epimorphism. I will tell you what is a split epimorphism. Is not a split epimorphism. So what is a, pli a, sp uh, a split epimorphism? Uh, it means that, um, so in which direction I need to do it? Uh, this is impossible. Uh, F composed with G equal identity of Z is impossible. Okay, I write it like that. So what I mean is that uh, whichever map you take from Z to Z prime, you will never uh, find the identity. So this means that it's not a split AP. So a split AP is such a way you can, you can actually do that. So each, if you take such a thing, then uh, Xi composed with uh, F equal zero. Okay. Okay. Another way to say that, that uh, maybe I write it like that. F is not isomorphic. I, I write another. Uh, is not isomorphic to something of the form z zero plus v to z, the, the natural projection on z. So yeah. Okay. You 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 avoid to have a morphism like that. Uh, this is what it means. It's not uh, a split AP. Then. Psi composed with f is equal to zero, and you can prove that it's equivalent. Or actually, it was said in the previous lecture that it's equivalent to f factors through v. It's an exercise I gave you in the previous lecture. Okay. Uh, wait, sorry, I didn't say what is. So you can factor f through v. It was a, what was there. Okay. Second point. The, it's equivalent to the following one, which is actually dual to this. For all g from x to x prime. So for all g, which is a non-split mono, not a split mono, that you can all know. So. This means epimorphism, by the way, it should be maybe this means monomorphism. Uh, so please get the definition by yourself. <laughs> uh, it's not a split monomorphism. Then uh, G composed with Xi equals zero. And please guess the equivalent condition by yourself as well. Um, okay, so I want to prove that these two things are equivalent. So I, I will prove it. It's not that difficult with what we already have. Yeah, I decided to do a bit proof because I guess for those who are not used to do this kind of manipulation, these proofs are kind of enlightening. And yeah, you should, you can get used to, to some interesting methods. So uh, what did I want to do? I want to start with a lemma, actually. So this lemma. So what do I want to do? Uh, I take the same notation. Um, I say that if xi is not zero, in other term, it's not the trivial one with y equal x plus v. So if xi is not zero, and v is indecomposable, I, I, I forgot a very important type of assumption. I will do, do it soon. If v is uh, 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 in decomposable, then xi composed with f is isomorphic to xi imply f invertible. Okay, now I this is not true as it's written. You need x and v in decomposable, otherwise it does not work. Sorry about that. I was a bit fast. Uh, you need x and v in the composable. Uh, OK, so this lemma. What about this lemma? Let's try to prove this lemma. You will see that it's not complicated at all, this lemma, with what we saw before. Proof. So 
I have my xi. I use implicitly the notation of the proposition or the theorem or no proposition. So I have my xi and uh, sorry, what? Uh, yeah, okay. And I have a f such that I can compose. So what is a f such that I can compose? It's something like that. I have my f. And what was the definition of xi composed with f? I just what it should be. So this is xi. But we did the assumption that xi composed with f is just uh, xi. So actually v is it's equal to z, right? To z prime. And this is the same extension. So we are in this situation. Okay? We are in a situation of this form where this is, is actually xi. I mean, this is an important point. Okay, but we know that f is either invertible or nilpotent. So if f not invertible, there exists a n such so that fn equals zero. Okay, this is the previous proposition. But such a diagram, it's completely linear. So you, you can put this thing to the power n. It will still commute. So I will do that because I'm lazy. I don't want to copy that. So this is equal to zero. Therefore, xi is actually equal to xi composed with zero. Okay, or I could go more directly and say I can put f to the n directly in this. Sorry, <laughs> it's not actually necessary. No, to, from z to z. Uh, z prime equals z finally because I, I have this identity. So to have this identity, so, sorry, I, I, I was uh, kind of reminding what is that, but when you know that it's that, then it should be z. <laughs> okay, so z prime equals z in this case. So xi is equal to xi composed with zero. Finish the proof. Uh, I, more precisely, it's a contradiction with that, right? Uh, so. Yeah, we know that f is invertible, and this will permit me to prove actually the proposition. So let's prove the proposition. So uh, yeah, the proposition is obviously, uh, I mean, symmetric. So I will prove only one direction. Proof: the two equivalent conditions are dual of each other. Actually, so you can go from one. So I assume one and not two, and I try to get a bug. So I assume one and not two. Uh, so what does it mean not two? I will start by not two. So I have my xi, which goes like that. So this is not two that I'm writing. And I have an x prime and a certain g. And here, what I know is that, uh, what is the point? Yeah, it's not a split mono. So I have zero, which is not equal to xi uh, composed, uh, g composed with xi. So I have a non-split or take that sequence, non-split means uh, uh, not equal to zero uh, of this form, right? And I have a commutative diagram like that. Uh, I don't know, I will call that G tilde, whatever. Oh, I have this, uh, this thing. But now, this is not a split mono. So by one, by one, uh, Okay, what I'm uh, saying actually, uh, G is not a split mono. Okay, G is not a split mono, so, so sorry. Uh, if this is non zero, so, uh, sorry for that, this map that I will call V prime, V prime is not a split AP. Okay, maybe I need more space, sorry. Uh, v prime is not a split AP. Indeed, when some map here is a split AP, it means exactly that this thing is zero as an extension. 
So V prime is not a split epi, and you use one. By one, it factors through V. Okay, so it factors through V, but I will not complexify too much my diagram, so the fact that it factors through V permits me to rewrite Xi here. So I have X, Y, Z, and then it factors through V means that I can find a map like that, that I will call, uh, I start to, to be out of letter to do something smart, so G tilde prime. Uh, I do that, and then there is a classical thing that you should know because it's, uh, it's very important. If I compose this three row, it's equal to that, therefore it's equal to zero. But if this composition is equal to zero, by definition of a kernel, it means that this composition factors through here. There exists a G. Okay? But now you are done. Because by the lemma, so now you have that uh, this is not a G, it's a G prime. You know now that Xi is equal to uh, G prime composed with G composed with Xi. By lemma, by lemma it means that uh, G prime composed with G is invertible. I will not do the end of the proof because it's pretty easy. You can actually draw the same diagram by inverting G prime and G. And what you will obtain is that G composed with G prime is also invertible. Therefore, I put dot, dot, dot to say that there is a dual argument to do. Uh, G is invertible. I mean, if you can find G prime composed with G invertible and G composed with G prime invertible, it means that G is invertible. But this is a bug because we were assuming that G is not a split mono, or maybe I can say it implies that G is a split mono. Okay, right. Actually, I don't want to say that. It implies that G is a split mono. Sorry for that. This is more correct because I didn't assume that X prime is indecomposable. So what I want is to actually tell you that G is a split mono, and it finished the proof because... Uh, yeah, it means that whenever this is non-zero, then G is a split mono, which is the contravariant of two, right? Okay, uh, sorry, it's a bit sloppy. I should not have assumed not two. I did not use not two. I just put two. Sorry? Yeah, 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 it's a short exact sequence, yeah. It means splits. It's, okay, so pay attention. I defined two things last time, short exact sequence and extension. When I say zero, I'm thinking in this, so I'm thinking in the equivalence class of zero, that means it splits. Uh, yeah, so, so, sorry, it's a bit of a shortcut, but uh, yeah, it, it's kind of convenient. Uh, so equal zero for a short exact sequence means split for me. Okay. Uh, Okay, so I did this proof, and then I give you a definition now. We say that a sequence which satisfies one equivalently two is called... So there are two names, so depending on uh, who you are, essentially. Uh, so uh, definition, psi in... So I will write psi in prop, but I mean prop 1 or equivalent 2 is called an Ausland Arrayton sequence or almost split. So I guess that uh, Idun Rayton still call it almost split out of uh, modesty, but most of other people call it Auslander Rayton sequence. So, yeah, you choose your, <laughs> your vocabulary. But, yeah, let's call it an Auslander Rayton sequence. Um, okay, so we have... So why almost split? Maybe almost split is actually 
interesting as well. So what is a split sequence? A split sequence is a sequence where this thing is equal to the direct sum of the other. And if you have a split sequence, you can do exactly the same, but you, you can remove either split epimorphism. So, for obvious reasons. So, it's almost split in the sense that it's split except for a very small amount of morphism. This, this idea, this is the closest possible to split. Or another way to say it is that psi f, psi composed with f is equal to zero for any non-trivial f. This is split, so it's very close to split. Okay, this is uh, the idea that you, you can have in mind for this vocabulary. A Ausland oriented sequence, of course, you cannot get an intuition of this term, except that it has been invented by Ausland oriented. Um, okay, so, right. Um, what did I want to say now? Uh, yeah, I wanted to do that. Uh, right, right, right. Oh, yeah, proposition. Uh, if x1, uh, if psi 0 uh, in x1, uh, vx is an AR sequence, the following two things hold. So, if psi is an extension of v prime to x, which is non-zero, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not quantifying an object. Each time there you need to have an object, just take it. Uh, so, if you have such an exact sequence, there exists a f from v to v prime such that psi composed with f is equal to psi zero and dual so dually okay maybe i write it but uh, uh, yeah so i take an extension from v to x prime which is non zero uh, and i say that uh, okay there exists a g such that uh, g composed with psi equal psi zero so i don't even tell you what is g because you can guess um, so, when I was saying before, if you know what is a circle, this is exactly the definition of a circle as long as you adapt it to, category, to the category side. A circle in a module is somebody that you can reach by applying element of the algebra uh, successively. I mean, you, you will get in the circle at some point. So, saying that is saying that actually psi zero generates the circle. Okay? together with the previous one. Yeah, okay, so this means that uh, a zero generate the circle. And uh, for the proof, I'm tempted to keep it as an exercise. And I will just give you orally some hint. So, what is the idea? The idea is the following one. The idea is to say, OK, I take something which is not an AR sequence. If it's an AR sequence, I'm already done. If XPI is an AR sequence, you just take the identity or, I mean, it's not complicated. So you suppose that you don't have an AR sequence, and you apply some F in such a way that you find something which is non zero. So you apply some f in such a way, so you choose a random f in such a way that psi composed with f is non-zero, so you don't have an AR sequence. Therefore, according to the previous thing, to the definition of AR sequence, it means that you can apply some f, which is known, uh, not split mono or something, and which uh, give you an, another sequence which is non-zero. And you reiterate this process. And the point is that by composing functions which are non-split mono or not split AP, which are non-split essentially, at some point you should find zero. Or it means that at some point you need to block the process, so you need to reach an AR sequence. So you take your, your, your non-AR sequence, you apply F, 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 or several versions of F, and 
You cannot do that infinitely because for dimension reason, when you compose things which are non-split AP or non-split mono, at some point uh, you find zero. I mean, because the dimension of the kernel increases, for example, or the dimension of the image decreases, and by dimension argument, it, you reach zero. So this is the strategy. You, you just do it by brute force. Okay, something I didn't say. It's modulo the fact that you prove that there is at most one AR sequence uh, up to isomorphism. So there is something I didn't say here. Uh, is that okay? Maybe I should say it. Hint, second hint, prove. Maybe it should be also in the in there. Prove that there is a unique AR sequence up to iso. So what does it mean? It means that uh, actually, if you have two AR sequence, you can link them like that with a F, uh, which is a, an automorphism, okay, or isomorphism even, if depending on your setting, okay. Uh, you okay? Or oh, actually, no. <laughs> okay, I, I'm a bit. Yeah, I should not write it like that. Sorry. I will write a proposition. Uh, because this is very, very messy. I didn't quantify my uniqueness, and it's bad. <laughs> it depends on what I'm quantifying. So, uh, actually, you need to use the next proposition. I should write it like that. Sorry. Uh, right. Um, okay, but I need a few definitions between my, before my next proposition. Uh, so, so, so I still have time to do it. So, definition one, uh, we say that X in web uh, projective if X1 X U equal zero for all U. Or all other object Q, uh, you can prove that it's equivalent to what you know if you know another definition of projective. So please convince yourself that it's equivalent to what you already know. And uh, we say that it's injective if x1 u y or u x equals zero for all u. Okay, and this the same, you can prove that it's the same injective that you know. The, the point is very easy. Uh, you are just saying that uh, all, uh, uh, so if you an, have an, epi, an, an epimorphism, you, the, the other definition of projective means that you can factor map from X to U to any uh, epimorphism onto U, but an epimorphism onto U, you take the kernel, it gives you an extension here, and yeah, you, you just play with it. Uh, okay, I, I don't want to enter in detail. This is an exercise I give you if you know another definition, check that it's equivalent. Okay, so I have that and I want another definition before giving my next proposition. We say that an F from X to Y, where X and Y are both indecomposable, is irreducible. So what is an irreducible map? It's, an, it's irreducible if, first of all, it's not an ISO, and for any decomposition of the form F equal F1 composed with F2, then F2 is a split mono, Or F1 is a split AP. So now I need to do a small comment because I didn't speak so much about split mono and split AP. Split mono and split AP, uh, what is a split mono? A split mono is something which up to dummy sum and is an isomorphism. A split mono is some injection of the form X included to X plus something, something that don't play a role. So if it's a split mono, it means that essentially you can discard some summon at the middle and it becomes an isomorphism. So of course, 
you can always write any morphism as a composition of an isomorphism and itself, or identity and itself. So this is irreducible in sense of irreducible that you know already. It's like uh, you cannot write as product of thing, uh, yeah, in a non-trivial way. It's what it means. Okay. So we have that, and um, I need a last notation, which is almost related to that, but there is a subtlety, so I need to say it. I will write this thing here of x plus y, or x two y, sorry. So this is annoying. I would like to have a set of irreducible uh, morphism from x to y. But this notion is obviously does not give you a good set. For example, if f is irreducible, minus f is also irreducible, and f minus f is not irreducible. Okay? Because, uh, yeah, zero is not irreducible. Zero is zero composed with zero. Oh, no, zero. Okay, no. Zero is not ir irreducible anyway. Maybe I should say non-zero. Yeah, maybe I will do that because, to be safe, zero is not irreducible. Um, Right. Uh, okay, so it's annoying. This is not a vector space. Therefore, we do a small different uh, definition. So what is here from x to y? Here from x to y is essentially all... So x and y are indecomposable to simplify. So x and y are indecomposable. So you start by taking the non-isomorphism. So non-iso from x to y. Non-iso from x to y, I didn't define the definition, but you can guess what it means. This form a vector space. The reason is that actually this is the proposition I did before. Uh, x and y are indecomposable, so either they are not isomorphic and non-isomorphism are everybody, either they are isomorphism, isomorphic and then you can go back to the previous blackboard that I erased at the beginning. If X and Y are isomorphic, then you, you get something which is basically the ideal, which is the maximal ideal I described before. So you have just something. And then you mod out that something that I will write non iso XY square. Uh, ah, no, I should not say that. <laughs> I should say something like non iso x y prime composed with non iso uh, y prime uh, y. Okay, sorry, it's a very bad notation. And you take the sum for the sum for all uh, y prime. Okay, what do I mean? You take this space. You take the non isomorphism. Sometimes it's everybody when x and y are not uh, isomorphic. And you mod out by any map which can be decomposed in a non-trivial way. So it's not exactly the space of this thing. It's somehow a space of good representative of that. So if you have an f which is irreducible and you add, it, add, up, add to it something which is reducible, in the sense non-non-irreducible, then it gives you something which is again irreducible and you can somehow identify them. They are, they are kind of the same because there are two irreducible maps which are equal up to a non-irreducible map. Therefore, you can kind of identify with that, and this is nice because it's a vector space. It's something which is nice. The other, the other one would not be nice. Okay? So, so yeah, I, I, I want to do that, yeah. Okay, now that I have the definition, I can give a proposition that I can justify more now. Um, wait, let me see the time. Okay, oh, I think I'm almost on time. <laughs> um, so, proposition. So, if Z is non project, is indecomposable, and non-projective. Then there exists a unique up to isomorphism short AR sequence 
of the form 0 tau I, I will tell you why I said tau later tau z uh, so tau z then I will put okay I will call it y it's not very smart but let's call it y of this form so there exists a unique AR sequence of this form, up to isomorphism. But of course, you need to assume that Z is non-projective because Z is proje projective is exactly the case where you have no short exact sequence at all of this form. So yeah, you need... It's tau Z. It's called tau Z. It's out of tradition at this point. Later, I say a bit more, okay? It's called tau Z. This is a tau. Okay, maybe... I don't know. This tau is better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, my tau are bad. <laughs> this is a tau. <laughs> okay. And if so, this is the first point. And the second point is that if x is indecomposable and non-injective, as you can imagine, there exists a unique, up to isomorphic, um, AR sequence of the form 0, x, y, tau minus... Okay, I'm tempted to use the notation that everybody uses, but there is a disclaimer which will come. Okay? Right. So you have a unique AR sequence of the following form. So before I continue the proposition, because there is some, uh, something following up in the proposition, uh, some remark. Actually, at this point, and I will, might say a bit better later, at this point, tau and tau and tau minus one are just some bijection between non-projective. So, in the composable, up to isomorphism. So I can apply. And then I get something which is non-injective, obviously, because you cannot put an injective here. Non-injective. And it turns out that it's actually indecomposable. So I write it, it's part of the proposition, up to isomorphism in the sense that uh, the way I wrote it is well defined only up to isomorphism. So I do that. And the point is that if you do that, that, that tau minus one is just the in, in converse for obvious reason, right? So, tau, by the existence, no, 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 okay, uh, sorry. Uh, this was a kind of joke, it's because some people did not understand what is, that it was tau, and I was trying to write a better tau. So, okay, maybe. <laughs> It's just because some people don't read my tau. So it's a tau. It's the Greek letter tau. That's just what I mean. <laughs> oh, okay. No, no, I think your question was uh, what, what did I. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is a, a, a really good point. Uh, I hide something here for a reason of time. The truth. The truth is that this is... Okay, maybe I should really not call that a proposition. Sorry. This is a theorem. This is non-trivial. You need to construct tau z. It takes time. Okay? So, I'm not saying... That, I, I'm not stating a trivial statement. You, you need to do something. You could have abelian category where it would not be the case. So it turns out that if you have a representation of a quiver, you have tau, okay? If you have a representation of a finite dimensional algebra, if you prefer, which is a bit more general, you also have tau. But it's a non-trivial statement, so I will not define tau. However, this thing determines tau. The fact that an R sequence like that, and I just need that for what happened later. And I guess that uh, Bernard and Pierre Guy will also need this characterization of tau. Or maybe if they need more, they will define it. Okay? So, uh, this is not constructive 
this is just an existential uh, shadow of the constructive proof. Okay. Um, okay, but I want to say a bit more, which make it slightly more constructive, even if it's still not completely constructive. Actually, you can describe these two maps. Uh, okay, I will. Okay, I will put u prime v prime like that. Uh, you will see. Actually, yeah. Up to isomorphism. Uh, yeah, what I said before was wrong. That's why I say use next theorem. It's because it, me it makes no sense to say in the. I would say, like, like that, there is a unique short uh, AR sequence. There is not a unique AR sequence in, uh, in the whole category, and there is not a unique AR sequence when you fix X and Z. So it was very imprecise. The uniqueness I wanted to say is uniqueness in this sense. When you fix one of the n terms, there is a unique uh, AR sequence. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, but once you fix Z, you fix Z, then there exists a unique. You fix X, there exists a unique. But uh, the, the point is the quantification. When I say uh, there is a unique AR sequence, it does not mean anything if I don't quantify, right? I need to quantify my statement to know uh, once Z is fixed, there is a unique one. But if you fix Z and X, there is, sometimes there is none. If you don't fix anything, of course, there, is much more, there are much more than one if you just look at the whole category, right? Sorry? Okay, uh, okay let, let's say more about the uniqueness. Uh, the isomorphism that I'm speaking about here is the following. You could, uh, you could uh, so in which direction I go, you could pre-compose, uh, no, pre or post-compose, post-compose xi with an isomorphism and get another one. So I identify xi and uh, say psi, oh no, uh, psi composed with psi for psi an isomorphism. So it's in this sense. You, you can have a second one, but if you make the, put the second one here, you can put an equal sign and an isomorphic sign here. You, you will be able to relate the short exact sequence by such diagram that I write always, except that this will be an isomorphism. Okay? So this is isomorphic in this sense. Of course, you, you, you all know that uh, you cannot define a representation to be unique. I mean, tau z cannot be unique at, with this definition. It can just be unique up to isomorphism, right? Sorry? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, sure, sure, sure. So uh, you need to understand the wall statement at the wall. I mean, this is an AR sequence. This is unique as an AR sequence. I'm not saying that there is a unique extension between something which is called Z and tau Z. This is not my point. There is a unique AR sequence. Z and tau Z can have other extensions which are not AR sequences. Yeah, to be very clear. Uh, the uniqueness is really for AR sequence. Okay, so I... I will, not, uh, I will not prove that, but I will describe slightly more what is V. In fact, V can be described in the, uh, in the following way. In fact, you can write V as going from a certain direct sum of Yi to V. And here I put... Uh, V1 up to, okay, V1 up to, no, no, I should put in a horizontal matrix if I want to be up to Vn. I didn't define n, but it's I equal 1 to n. So what are V1 up to Vn? V1 up to Vn are actually basis of a reduce, reducible map. So essentially, uh, okay, it's probably not a good way to write like that, but um, write. Uh, y i uh, runs on uh, uh, are all in decomposable such that 
the irreducible of yi to z is non-zero. So there is already a statement here. I'm just telling you that there are finitely many. It's not so trivial a priori, right? So there are finitely many objects from which are irreducible map to z. And additionally, uh, yeah, the vi's uh, form bases of irreducible yiz. So in other terms, uh, yeah, are all indecomposable with multiplicity. <laughs> I will write it like that. In other terms, uh, yeah, uh, you repeat yi, the number, the dimension of that space-time. Of course, if it's zero, then you don't repeat it at all. That's the point. Okay. Um, so, and then you take a basis of irreducible map, and then you just uh, sum them like that, you just uh, put them in a metric like that, and it will give you your v. Okay? I will not write the dual, but you can all write it for u prime. Of course, it's also true for u, because essentially these two things are the same as long as you, yeah, you can identify them if you... So, yeah, for u prime, what it means is that essentially you take all irreducible morphism from x, instead of all irreducible morphism to z, okay? Right, and this permits me, so in a sense this is slightly more constructible, it's constructive, as long as you have a good method to list irreducible map toward an object, right? So it's still uh, not completely constructive, but uh, right, it's kind of work. And now I will define what is the Auslander rate and quiver. Um, let me see if I'm not going to be out of time. Uh, okay, no, but uh, okay, uh, le let me be very clear. Uh, uh, yeah, you have notion where of studying objects where all objects have one dimensional circle or that. Here, <laughs> yeah, X1 as a functor in a certain sense, I have one dimensional circle on both sides. I, I did not... Pre okay, for those who are used to that, I will give a statement orally, but forget about it if you are not used. If you fix, what it says is that if you fix the object Z, the functor X1 Z, comma dash, has a circle, has a, a mod Q module, representation of Q module. So you can define a notion of a module over a category, and this notion of module over a category, x1, z dash, as a functor, has a one dimensional circle which is supported at tau z. Okay? This is what it actually means. Uh, forget about it if you are not used, and especially because I didn't say so much about what I mean about one dimensional. Uh, if k is not algebraically closed, become more tricky. Okay, no, I, uh, I stop the. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, this is. I mean, uh, no. I, okay, no. Gorenstein is property of algebra having all module having good properties. Uh, that's a bit. <laughs> it means that uh, I don't want to rewrite that for u prime, but you can have the same characterization for u prime. Uh, so, by, you can guess, right? Just uh, replace all the row in the other direction and do, do the same work. Uh, or don't it if you understand without doing it. <laughs> uh, okay, everything is self-dual in this theory. I mean, like, you, you can always, uh, yeah, you can dualize all properties. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's not a directed theory somehow. <laughs> okay, so now I want to define what is the um, the Auslander rate and quiver, and I will give you an example. So, definition I, I have all the ingredients actually. The AR quiver, so maybe a disclaimer I say quiver because we are used to say quiver, I could say graph as well. At this point, I'm not planning to. 
study representations of the AR quiver. So it's not a quiver that I draw in order to study representation of it. It might be interesting in other contexts, but this is not my point here. And yeah, you could, anyway, if you had to study representation of the air quiver, you should add a relation on the air quiver anyway, otherwise it makes no sense. Okay, so end of the disclaimer, this is just a graph for us. So the air quiver uh, of Q, say, have um, vertices the indecomposable object as, as vertices, maybe I should the indecomposable uh, representation. And as usual, up to isomorphism, otherwise it's not categorically well defined, and as a rose basis of irreducible map of uh, irreducible. I will write it like that. So x, y, if, if x, y are two vertices, you do that. And of course, the basis, it's not completely well defined because you can change the basis, but at least as a graph, as a kind of combinatorial data, it does not change. The two bases have the same size, so you can, yeah, you can see it just as a graph. And usually we write, I, I just write it like that, we, we depict Uh, by something which looks like that, the AR translation. So it does not look like a definition. Uh, okay, I didn't say what is the AR translation, so it's a good way, a time to, to define. This is a tau. So the AR, AR standard written translation just means tau. Okay? So when I say that, it does not look like a definition, but it's look it's more a recipe to interpret when people say, I depict the air cylinder written quiver. If they are dashed a row, it means that this is the air cylinder written translation. If there are no dashed a row, it means that, yeah, if, yeah, if they just didn't write it. <laughs> okay, so this is tau, the tau which is there. Uh, I didn't write that it's called the air cylinder written translation, so I write it now. Okay, so I will give you an example. I guess I still have a bit time for an example. And actually, I will even give you... Ah, okay. I, I hope you will allow me five minutes more than this counter. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's do uh, an example. Basis, oh yeah, so, I mean, for any two in the composable, uh, you have here, which is a vector space, and you draw a basis. Uh, of course, you, you could replace that. You, you draw as many rows and the dimension of this, or you decide that it's a basis. It's up to you. It's not so well fixed terminology somehow. <laughs> it's not a terminology which is fixed at this point. Sometimes we want to really identify it with a basis. You will even describe what it is. Sometimes we just count the rows, and this is what I will do now, actually. Example, uh, I take Q equal this nice quiver. I will just draw it because uh, the recipe to draw it will take too much time. So I will just draw it and you describe it vaguely. Uh, so uh, I start to from the... And I will tell you immediately what are my modules. Okay, so for those who are familiar, this is some diagram you saw uh, thousands of times. So first of all, how to interpret this, uh, this thing? So these are, of course, the vertices. Of course, you will think that uh, I'm missing some data. So I just put the vector space at each vertex. But from K to K, you don't have that much choice of linear map up to isomorphism, you can just put the identity. So whenever you have 2k which are neighboring, you put the identity. Of course, if you have zero, you put zero because you have no other choice. Okay? 
You put identity, you could as well put any lambda which is non-zero, it will give you an isomorphic representation. Okay? These arrows are irreducible maps, so you can see immediately what they are. This is some kind of inclusion. I mean, you, you put k to k, you put the identity, and there is zero, and you check that it commutes. Please check it as an exercise if it's not obvious. And there, here you project. Okay, five minutes more. <laughs> here you project. Um, so what it means is that you need to project that to zero and check that it commutes, but yeah, uh, please check. And then the AR translation is like that. And what is, just for the sake of the example, what is the AR sequence which ends here? You need to take this at the end term and the sum of all irreducible map going, there are two. So the middle term will be that, and when you compute the kernel, it will be that. So this is an AR sequence. So I hope you understand what I mean. You take this, the sum of these two maps, and the retraction. So if you do it properly with a good sign, the composition is zero, and this is a short exact sequence, and this is an R sequence. So this is relatively easy to read on the, on the graph, right? Um, okay, and for example, you have another which is like that. I will not draw, there are three of them. You can draw all of them if you want. Uh, so you have R sequences. Okay, now... Uh, I have two things I wanted to do, and uh, hmm. okay, I will try to start very fast by doing the Auslander Rayton duality. Uh, this is something very important, but uh, we are almost done already for the R duality. So I will write it as a theorem the R duality, so Auslander Rayton duality, sorry. So let's take x, y in decomposable. Then, uh, and sorry for specialist, we will uh, shout at me immediately, but I will explain. You have that. Okay, you have this sequence of isomorphism. This is a k-dual. And these are natural isomorphisms. Otherwise, I would not need the k-dual. Yeah, this is why you, I was saying you would shout at me, but I did it voluntarily. Um, I will say in one second, I will correct in one second as you want. Uh, what is what? Is there, there is an n somewhere? Uh, then? No. It's the one, sorry. It's because, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, okay, it's a French typing font. Uh, we put always, yeah, this is not a seven, it's a one. <laughs> okay, uh, we, we always put one like that. Uh, it's not always, as you see, for my tau minus one. Anyway, idea of proof. Uh, very short idea, so you can complete as an exercise. You prove that the following thing hold. Uh, so you go from home. I, I prove only one of them because they are symmetric. Or I prove. I give you. So you go from home tau x cross x to one. X tau x. Uh, why I put uh, no y tau x? Sorry. To x to one. X tau x. Okay. Uh, sorry. Tau of projective in this thing is equal to zero, and tau minus of injective is equal to zero as well. Uh, this is a kind of extension to make things work. Okay? So you go here, and here you map, you go to k by mapping the AR sequence to one. Okay, and I claim the following thing that you have to check that it is uh, non degenerate. By linear form. Okay, if you have a non degenerate by linear form, it means that these two things are dual of each other. Okay, two things. How to prove that? Though first of all, this thing is not well defined, you have several choice. You just take any linear map which map R sequence to one. You can choose an AR sequence to one. Okay, so the only point is that R sequence should not be mapped to zero to make it work. First point. 
Second point, uh, how to prove that? Essentially, as you can imagine, you take an extension and you find a morphism. This is not that difficult. If you have a morphism, uh, maybe... Uh, yeah, I hope I still have slightly... Second, because I want to... If f goes from y to tau x, you can factorize it through the image of f. So you can always write something like that. This two map exist, and you need to use that in order to prove. Why I had a complaint? I had a complaint for a yellow part that I will add now. So actually, I could add that. I could say, um, I, I mod out, and I will tell you immediately what I mean. I mod out by morphism, which factor through injective, factoring through. Injective. And here I mod out through morphism, factoring through projective. And why did I write it in yellow? Because, uh, because my, uh, my uh, conventions are not coherent. Because actually it's not needed. Also, uh, we are used to that for Q. It's needed only if you have second extension, if you are used to that. Otherwise, you don't need to stabilize. So it's needed, but for a general or other cases, I mean, I will write other cases, I'm sorry, it's not so. So if you try to prove it, you will realize that at some point, you use some long exact sequence, and you use the last term that I put uh, last time that was in yellow as well. Okay, my convention are kind of pseudo-coherent. And the last thing I want to do, it's a kind of game, but uh, okay, it's why, why we would play, because mathematics is kind of game. I will do some simplified version of what did Jacob a few, uh, <laughs> a few days ago. I, I'm sorry, I'm kind of extending, but it's a very interesting game. So, and also, it's, it's a game, so it's nice. So, I will do that. x1, x2, x3. I write something like that. And then, I do lazy mutation. What is lazy mutation? I notice that when I mutate a quiver at a thick or a source, that means something which has no composition, I just reverse a row. But as I'm even more lazy, I write everything on the same graph. It will become messy. So I have this. It's a seed. Okay? I want to mutate at x3. What happens? I will have this quiver which will appear. But I know that x1 and x2 will not change, so I will write it here without changing x1 and x2. And I will just rewrite here that I have 1 plus x2 divided by x3. So now my second seed is here. Okay? My second seed is here. Uh, I finished the graph because I, I, I think you are all angry. So x1, I'm sorry, I'm copying because... And if I do a mistake, just tell me. You can try to compute faster. Uh, but, uh, yeah. I'm really not efficient at writing that fast. So you, you see what I'm doing. I'm, I'm just mutating, but each time I come on things, I keep them together. Okay? Okay. Now... I will not ask you, do you see some similarity with the previous picture? Right? I, guess, I hope you see some similarity with the previous picture. Uh, okay, there is clearly a similarity with the previous picture, right? Uh, do you see more similarity with the previous picture than the first one you saw? 
Yeah, you see difference, for, for, first of all. First of all, it seems that I can continue infinitely, which I cannot here. Secondly, even if I restrict to a domain, so what would be a fundamental domain? It would be here, up top, there, okay? Uh, after it repeats, so why not cutting here? Even if I do that, it's slightly bigger, right? It's slightly bigger than there, so it's not exactly what I want. But I told you this is not so surprising because uh, when we did uh, the Gabriel theorem, I told you that these things are indexed by roots of a root system, positive root, and this one are indexed by almost positive root. So there are three more, the three negative simple roots. So this is normal. So what are the three negative simple roots? Obviously, they are here. These ones are weird, the other ones are all the same kind. Now that you saw that, is there anything more that you notice? So this is uh, if you are good at uh, observation. No, no, I, I don't write them. Uh, you could write them, but these are exam essentially the mutation that I did. So each time I mutated, I mutated along an R sequence. But no, something you could notice is that the dimension vector of this is equal to the denominator of that. So look at the first lower right, you have 0, 0, 1. Here you have x3. The second one, you have 0, 1, 1. You have x2, x3. The one on the top, you have 1, 1, 1. You have x1, x2, x3. It's uh, general. Okay, so now it permits me to tell you what I want to do next week. I want to explain that, essentially, to give a proof of of this thing. And uh, Bernard and Pierre Guy would do it even more generally. Okay, so essentially the idea now is to understand how to go from here to there. And there are several possible strategies, but essentially they boil down to the same strategy. I mean, you can do it more generally or less generally. I will do it less generally. Pierre Guy and Bernard will do it more generally, but it should give you an idea that it's somehow a generalization of what I will explain. Okay, thank you and sorry for having extended my time. Thank you very much. And are there any questions? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a very good remark. Uh, let's try to write that at the same way, in the same way as that. So I will write x1 equal 1 over x1 minus 4 to the minus 1. Okay, it's ugly, but let's do like that. Then it means that this should correspond to a module of ve dimension vector minus 1, 0, 0, that of course you cannot see here. Now, think about this thing. First of all, uh, it corresponds to simple negative root, as you can see, because this is minus 1, 0, 0, so it's a simple negative root. So these are exactly the ones we are missing in the Gabriel theorem compared to the theorem that Jacob gave. But second thing, if you make grow a bit the representation of the quiver as Bernard will do next week, so he will add some object in a certain way, and he will get some the picture which will be exactly like that. So there is a way to create uh, these objects which are missing. This is not as elementary, so I didn't want to do it, but you can add uh, the object, and then it will really work as it should be. That means that this thing will add up with morphism like here, and you will be able to close it like that. So it will not be drawn like that on a blackboard, it will be drawn on a Möbius band. I mean, if you look carefully here, this thing is in the opposite orientation. If you try to glue, you will create a Möbius band. Uh, so Bernard will introduce some category which is a bit bigger than what the category of representation of Q, which actually include this negative symbol. Yeah? Uh, okay, so how do I connect? A fr what is your exact question? It depends on the meaning of the question. So the way I connect it, if I recognize that this picture looks like that part. Okay? So, unfortunately, I missed something. This is what Bernard will add up, but it's here. Um, okay? Uh, and then I recognize some numerical coincidence at this point. 
Next week, hopefully, it will not be any more numerical coincidence. The denominator of this cluster variable are all different. And if you forget about the numerator, a bit like uh, Tomoki Nakanishi did, you, you kind of look only on one part of the story. You, you look at the factor which is the important one when you factorize in two terms. The one which is complicated can be deduced from the other one. You forget about it. You take the non, the simple one which was on the left on all the formula that he gave. So it means essentially that you replace that by 1 over x1, x2, x3. You forget about the numerator in this factorization. If you do that, then you find exactly the dimension vector of the corresponding representation. This is 1, 1, 1, k, k, k. This is 0, k, k. So they coincide perfectly. The only point is to be able to compute the numerator, which is the complicated or annoying part. Okay? But I will explain how to do it next week from the representation as well, but it's more complicated than the denominator. Okay? Okay, any more questions? Yeah? Uh, yeah, 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 you are right. Uh, what did I want to write? Yeah, of course, uh, home... Homo, this is okay. This is x, y. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, I, I didn't write actually what it is. It's just uh, if you have f. Okay, sorry. It's it's. I should write f xi. You map it to f composed with xi. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, which is yeah. Sorry. Yeah, thank. Yeah, this is important. Uh, if you try to prove it, uh, this is a good hint uh, how to start the proof. Okay, any more questions? Uh, yes. No more questions. Let's thank Lauren. <laughs>